ఓం నమస్తే టు ఆల్ టుడే వి ఆర్ గుణ టాక్ అబౌట్ an interesting topic which we are all familiar about rather two facets of the topic first one is about i ourselves the second one is about happiness which we are all wanting so from that perspective we are going to wade into this topic little bit deeper because we are anyway comfortable with what is i who is i and we all want happiness that's a given so instead of taking the usual insight into itihasa puranas and trying to extract some essence out of it today's topic is something which we are all familiar with and if you look at the last several q and a's the questions have been more centered around the practical aspects and that's what made me think that we should take a topic like this to understand why we are chasing happiness or what is happiness this is a question that narada maharishi poses to sanat kumara the mind born son of brahma of course both of them were mind born sons only and the question as they are wading in deeper into the topic sanat kumara talks about it in chandogya upanishad just to give a quick quote यदा वै सुख लभ्यते तरोति न सुख लब्वा करोति सुखमे लब्वा करोति सुख विजिज्ञास बेसिकली वाट इट सेस इज एव्री पर्सन वॉन्ट्स ओनली हैपीनेस दे डोंट चूज टू वर्क इफ दे डोंट पर्सीव दट देर इज हैपीनेस इन दैट and only by doing your things what you understand as happiness you go in that journey now if you choose poor things for happiness your gunas are going to reflect that and if you are choosing higher things for happiness you are going to be more evolved it's as simple as that but he says everybody is chasing happiness now narada says i want to know about happiness and we are not going to go deep into that topic of chandogya upanishad that's not our purpose but it is suffice to say that we are all chasing happiness in one way shape or form a person who is just resting in a lazy boy couch or what we call as easy chair in india doing nothing just gets up for going to the bathroom even gets his food taken care he has a control of the remote with which he can turn any channel at his command he feels he or she feels that they have arrived at the top of the game because that's all their mind wants at the other end you find someone who is working so hard to make ends meet so that their family can have a basic needs met you also find someone who is stinking rich and yet they are pursuing things which they consider as happiness so we are all pursuing happiness from different points you go and catch hold of a ant 
if you could communicate with that ant the ant is busy doing its thing and it will say i am going collecting the food why are you doing that because i am doing it for my colony why do you have to do that because i feel happy an earthworm is burrowing and doing its own thing again for happiness a plant is happy because it is going towards the sun it's putting its branches on leaves and so anything and everything you find is looking at happiness that's a given now now the problem comes with two things problem one what do i define as i and what is real happiness now that's a curve ball one most of us would duck so let's look at from a perspective of just what you and i call as i we look at our own like i come to you and say like hey how are you feeling and you say i got a headache from all day you know like it's now you are referring to the i as the body now you may be in a you are somebody is in a bad mood and i come and say like hey what what's happening what what, what are you doing how are you feeling same i feel terrible i feel happy i feel sad here the i you are referring is a your mind your emotion and then you go to the next level and you talk about your intellect sometimes we talk about i got pangs of hunger i am thirsty now that is referring to your prana your life force so the very fact that you and i are referring to different things and we somehow manage to communicate i go and tell atma ji i am talking about i am hungry so he knows i am talking about something okay is talking about his life force he is feeling that pangs of hunger so he needs some food he is talking about maybe his body maybe about his prana then i go to atma ji and say you know what i was expecting this thing for like last 10 years man it finally happened i am so happy now atma ji can immediately understand i am referring to as the mind because i am talking to as an emotion so what is this i we keep referring and that becomes an interesting journey we are all going to pursue and eventually we have to figure out that i refers to the atma i refers to the real essence of me and that i is masked by many many other eyes which i misunderstand or mistake as the real i so we need to keep this background in context because we are going to go we are going to start wading deeper and deeper into what is happening the next thing what happens i want an object how, how does uh, how do we get happiness right let's understand basically what is happiness now before we categorize the happiness basic understanding of happiness is what i want something i get that object my mind is happy it could be an idea it could be money it could be another person could be anything so here we are talking about happiness and when we are talking about happiness it we there are two places this idea of a desire arises will have to have this foundational understanding before we get to the next few more steps of trying to uncover the different categories of happiness and what we can do to get lasting happiness and what are the things we need to tweak in our head so what actually happens is 
the first pattern my mind deploys the five senses it casts its vision outside and it starts interacting with the objects of what it may consider as possible pleasure or not so what it does it basically tries to engage with what we call as the world and try to procure things that would match my needs your needs will be different from another person's needs why is that for an alcoholic the next bottle is a piece of heaven that's what he thinks at least although it may be causing him pain we will look at it how different happiness are different but for a person who is a teetotaler it's pain for a vegetarian the real smell of burning or cooking carcass of other animals is a torture whereas for a person who is a non vegetarian it's delicious so why do such variances happen we'll get into that and what happens uh, in the different pathways so bottom line here our mind deploys these senses it goes into the world of objects emotions and thoughts and it pulls out all these experiences for the mind to process the mind finds something agreeable and it is happy and it says i want this and then you and i deploy our organs of action and we try to procure those things to enjoy that experience it may be um the the rose in the garden which you just planted few months ago the first blooming beautiful rose or it may be the neighbor girl whom we may be admiring or it may be the choicest food that you are interested in or whatever that tickles your mind now here what happens the mind comes and develops a catches a desire now there is another way the mind can catch this desire that we call as vasanas for example if i am going to a street they are cooking all this nice masala stuff and things like that you can smell from one mile away all your favorite foods now you get really hungry and you say like i want all those food which is there so your senses brought that experience and you are like yes i want more of it and you check it but let's say that you are not in any store you are just at home in fact you are locked in and it is raining outside you can't go outside and there is an outage so you can't watch tv or your phone is also not working now you are just watching rain suddenly you remember you know what in this beautiful rain my mother used to make garma garam pakode or how nice it will be to have some bhajji or whatever that you prefer so where did this thought come from that you need this bhajji or pakoda or whatever that what we call from vasanas vasanas are basically impressions that are left in our mind we were discussing about vasanas yesterday also uh, for some of you who are there we are talking about vasanas extensively yesterday so those vasanas are creating a pressure on the mind and it bulges and it it gives rise to a desire or there are experiences the senses are bringing in that impinge on the mind and 
they produce this idea called a desire. Now you got caught with a desire. Now what happens? That desire has to manifest. If that desire didn't manifest, what is going to happen? You are going to feel miserable. When the desire was not even there, you didn't feel that misery. But once the desire has been born, now you get attached to that desire. What also happens is along with the desire comes an idea of attachment. Now the degree to which we are attached to this desire, now usually what happens, the normal person cannot separate the desire and this attachment. You have to be a real advanced sadhaka to look at it and understand that desire is not the same as attachment. But in 99.9999 percentage of the cases, this attachment and desire are like fused. They are almost inseparable. You can't even tease them out. And in such a scenario, what happens? You take your attachment and desire combo and we are hung upon the outcome. When this outcome doesn't match your needs, that produces sorrow. The degree of sorrow is directly proportional to the degree of your attachment. It is not directly proportional to the size of your desire. You can have small desire, big desire. You can say like, I want to dream about the stars or I want only some peanuts. Doesn't matter. It is the attachment you and I have to the desire that make all the trouble. The intensity of desire is going to produce the intensity of other emotions in us. So if I am very much attached to this particular idea that it has to happen and that idea didn't happen, to that extent I will be upset. See for example, you look in a small classroom, there are different types of kids, right? There are kids who are always getting 100 and they, for them 100 is nothing. And there are kids who get 80 and 90, they are happy. There are kids who barely pass, they get only 40. Let's assume that it's in India, mostly 40, right? So 40 is pass. And there are others, they don't care if they pass or they fail, there is no problem. They just go their own merry ways, they are not worried about the consequences. Now here is the kicker. A child expecting 40, if he gets 45 by any chance, he is like flipping, he is like so happy. But a child who is expecting 100 got 98 due to one silly mistake. And if the child is very much attached, you hear in, in the board exam season when the results come, how many kids commit suicide because they fell short of their expected marks or they didn't land in a particular college or whatever, right? You hear that sad news all over the... all across time, right? In different places. So that should basically tell you that the intensity of the attachment is the driving factor, not the size of the desire. So what does Krishna got to say? Now Krishna is telling you the ladder of the fall. He gives you a beautiful ladder of our fall if we go in that reverse gear. Now we are not going to go into the details, but it is good to keep that in the back pocket. Dhyayate vishayan pumsaha sangaste so jayate. So dhyayate vishayan pumsaha, he says like by constantly thinking about the sense objects. But hey, you know what? Ah, that beautiful girl. Ah, that masal dosa. Ah, this. Ah, that. By repeatedly casting that desire in our mind, 
we are continuously associating that now you don't even have to have possession of that object for you to associate by continuously associating with that particular object the mind because of that sangha there is an attachment now from that attachment what happens sangha sanjayate kama from that intense attachment is born kama desire kamat krodo abijayate from kama from desire if it didn't matter like i want something very bad and somebody is i perceive that somebody is stopping it all that desire now got converted into blinding rage on that person who tries to stop now when we go to that stage oh we are already in a very bad shape now what actually happens is what krishna is explaining krodhat bhavati sammoha from that blinding rage you know like rage blinds us we all know that right when you get so much anger you don't know who is standing in front of you from that comes delusion sammoha sammoha smriti vibrama from delusion what happens you have like loss of memory all the good things you learnt hey you know what this is the guru who taught everything this is your mother this is your father this is your wife this is your husband doesn't matter how many crimes are being committed when we lose ourselves to this rage we are deluded and now we have lost all the memory of all the things associated with what should have happened we lose it and then what happens smriti bramshat buddhi nasho when we lose this memory we also have complete loss of intelligence buddhi nashat pranashyati when you lose that you completely get destroyed from within now why do we have to know this particular thing we are not even going in this track right actually we were only traveling in this track but there is a small detour we saw that sangat sanjayate kama kama krodo abijayate but what happens this is only when the intensity is really 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 mad uh, strong and everything gets converted to rage and wrath but you and i don't get that rage and wrath for everything right so what happens there is another side step krishna talks about it elsewhere but we are not going to go into that what happens when i get this desire i go and act how do i act i act through my thoughts words or action after i act what am i interested in i am doing this entire action for only for that outcome and if that outcome is not in my favor what is going to happen now we already told we are not going that track of anger wrath and that sort of thing so what is going to happen we are going to get upset we are going to get unhappiness we are going to get sorrow and then what happens we are going to go back looking how can i fix this maybe this object was not for me at this time maybe some other object can give me that pleasure so i go looking for another object that doesn't work i go to another and if you really look at our own life how it looks is it all the time happiness or all the time sorrow can anyone say that you have unending happiness or unending sorrow in your life it is not true because the way we are experiencing the world we have we are happy sad 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 happy happy 
सैड सैड हैप्पी सैड हैप्पी 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 सैड 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 हैप्पी सैड सो वी आर हैविंग दिस कंटिन्यूस चेंज ऑफ आवर इमोशंस बेस्ड ऑन द ऑब्जेक्ट्स वी आर एक्सपीरियंसिंग वाई वी शुड गो आफ्टर दैट इज अनदर इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग why do i need to go after an object to feel myself happy let's ask that question now when i am going to look at an object why do i feel that there is an incompleteness there is a boy and a girl why does the boy has to look at the girl and say like hey i am incomplete without you or the other way around why do a person have to say like hey i am incomplete without say a bottle of alcohol or a drug or a smoke or whatever why because what happens every jeevatma is feeling two simultaneous forces and experiences at the same time on one end it feels that its real nature is telling that hey your real nature is being complete so i piece i have a piece of iron i put it outside what is going to happen after 10 years i come back there is no iron piece it's already rusted because the iron's natural tendency is to bind with oxygen and be in the state of like ferric oxide ferrous oxide whatever that thing is so it naturally goes back to that state on the other hand i artificially create that and put it in that state and i want to maintain it as a iron there is a conflict there so same way the real nature of ourselves is atman atman is not having father mother brother sister its real nature is sat chit ananda and here we are trying to come and say no 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 i want only ananda but where am i looking i'm looking at the wrong place i'm looking at the wrong place and i am saying like i want ananda from a place where ananda is not there then the second thing what happens is when i experience happiness i do not know where this happiness is coming from why is this happiness arising in my bosom happiness is coming in your mind because let's do a thought experiment you want something so you at this point we already established that we don't know our real nature as jeevatma we don't know we are only thinking ourselves as a body as a mind as an entity as all these different labels and monikers which you ideas which you have put instead what you and i are doing is you now we are going to say like i assume that i don't know that leave that but i want some object whatever is your object of desire in your mind you want that let's say that you get that object maybe a cup of coffee maybe anything anything trivial it could be anything grand it doesn't matter so what happens at that time i want this happiness because i work towards that object and i grasp that object at that second there is no other thought emanating from my mind and there is quietude imagine you go to the ocean and that it is perfectly serene not a single wave in the entire ocean don't ask me how just do, doing a thought experiment now what happens that is exactly what happens in your mind for that split second for that millisecond or for that second you don't have any other thought arising you feel the quietude in your heart and you think that is happiness that came because of enjoying that object now ask yourself simple question 
if that object was really going to be giving you happiness, once you got that object, you should be happy forever. But the minute your mind goes to something else, you find, no, 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 I want some other object and your mind goes off. What happened to this happiness then? Gone. So you and I think you are trained to go and chase these objects and that is what this materialistic mindset is all about. Then That's how Asuras think. You have these Devas and Asuras, right? what we call as uh, uh, wrongly equated as uh, demons in uh, English, right? So you have Devas and Asuras. These Asuras have a mindset of thinking everything from a materialistic point of view. Now you can ask the question to yourself, hey, how are we so different then? Yeah, we share a lot of our negative traits with that. So what exactly happens? In our, once you uh, ch chase one object after the other object after the other object, your mind is thinking that happiness is in the object, it's not coming from within. And we keep chasing object after object after object. This cycle repeats all over again. Now let us try to understand generally how happiness arises or happiness is that so if you have for some person you will say like if there is no sorrow that is happiness isn't that right now I, we are going to do a lot of thought experiments today now let's say that you go to a shop Whatever you are buying, let's say you're buying rice, sugar, whatever, tea or whatever. You buy a kilo of it in a bag. You're coming home. And as you open, unlock the do door and enter your house, you find some person standing. Who is it? It's me. And I'm telling you, stop whatever you are doing. Stand where you are. Keep holding that bag. Initially, you it's not going to be heavy. It's like, okay, I can hold a bag. It's only a kilo of tea leaves. It's not going to be heavy. Now, after five minutes, your hand is getting like twitchy and you want to change the hands. I say, no, hold it in the same hand. Continue. In the same posture, you can't move out outside the perimeter. You can't even move your foot, just standing there. And for some miraculous reason, you listen. Okay, that is part of the uh, assumption. Now, after an hour or two, you are not going to like me already, but somehow you continue to listen. After one full day, I made you stand there. It is only one kilo. You are used to lifting it. You could have gone up and down. You, you have no problems. You are a, like a heavy weight lifting gym rat and you could bench press so much amount of weight. But holding this simple one kilo, now if you don't want one kilo, you could replace it even with a simple pen. Doesn't matter. Now, the longer you are going to be there, you are, of course, you are going to be mad at me. But besides that, what is going to happen? You are feeling miserable inside. Now, I tell you, stop this experiment. First thing you are going to do is keep the uh, back down. You are going to rotate your arms or whatever. And you are going to feel a sigh of relief. I am going to ask you, are you happy? You are going to say, I am absolutely happy. I don't have to carry that stupid bag again. The idea is, when you went to the store, you went empty-handed. 
but you had 100 things in your mind, 100 things weighing on your mind. And if I had asked you the same question, are you happy or not? You are going to say it depends. Depends on things that are pressing your mind. But now, you had no reason to be unhappy as you enter the house and you got caught in this thought experiment and now you made your life so miserable for the last 24 hours. Now at the end of it, I say, you don't have to do this torture. Now you suddenly you are extremely happy. Where did that happiness come? So, absence of sorrow is a telltale sign of happiness. For some other people, it is like fulfilling all the desires. Like, hey, I, I, I want a, um, a pay raise. Okay, I got it. Hey, I want to go to a nice restaurant. Wow, they, they, they cook the best dish you want and uh, they, they made it special. And what more special, they just figured out that you are the yanth customer entering, so they gave it free. Oh, now you are double happy. At the same time, if you are also looking, if you are having a sense of having done whatever you should be doing, like you, you were very tense about an exam, you prepared well, they asked only the questions that you had prepared and you finished writing the exam and you had 10 minutes to double check whatever you are to write, double check and you are happy. You have a sense of finishing everything. So now you are going to be happy. And then there is the fourth or the another element of being like you have completed all your everything what you can attain. Like you, you, you have made millions of dollars, you have a beautiful relationship, you have like, children of your choice and they are also well behaved magically and so on and so forth. You got all the ducks in a row to speak. Now you are happy. So happiness, what we understand is coming from different flavors. Now, what really happens in this entire journey of this desire to uh, uh, the fructification of the actual action, karma, the karma phala? You would have this desire that, as I said, could have come from within or without and it pushes you to do an action, the karma. That karma again fructifies as a karma phala. This karma phala will not come at your speed and time. Let's say that you just got married to a beautiful girl of your choice. And uh, a few weeks later, your uh, wife says, Hey, I'm pregnant. Great news. But you still got to wait nine months for the baby to come. It, does, it won't pop out immediately. So, between karma and karma phala, there is usually a gap. Like I write my exams, I have to wait for one month or two months for the results to be announced. Though my results are only contained in my action of how I did the exam. So, we have to understand that in between that gap, what is happening? In between the karma and karma phala, we are not keeping quiet. We are busy adding more vasanas. We are busy dreaming, projecting. Now, is it wrong? No, that's what everybody does. Yes, that's right. But here we are trying to look from the lens of a sadhaka, from the lens of a person who is aware of their own self, aware of their own mind, aware of their own uh, components that make themselves. Why do they have to do that? Because you can live a normal life. But a person going in this path is 
aware of that so they know what are the pitfalls what are the things they need to be watchful of now we understood little bit about happiness let's turn our attention to the different types of happiness if you will now this may be surprising to people who have not cracked open the bhagavad gita and if you have if you go to the 18th chapter krishna is in the mood of threes everything is describing in threes you know whatever is sattva rajas tamas from that lens everything so he is saying 333 three types of vision three types of desires three types of uh, actions three types of this three types of everything so even the happiness is of three types sukham trividani tividani trividam shunu me bharata shava there are three types of happiness listen to me carefully that's what krishna says यतद् अग्रे विषमिव परिणामे अमृतोपमम तत्सुकम सात्विकम प्रोक्तम आत्म बुद्धि प्रसाद जम ही सेस यतद् व्हेन व्हेन समथिंग और व्हिच दैट और दैट व्हिच अग्रे मींस इन द बिगिनिंग विषमिव like poison pariname amrutopamam in the end it turns out to be so good it's like amruta it's like nectar such a thing tatsukam satvikam that kind of thing is satvikam now we will have to put a comma here and put this next phrase in the back pocket because we need to come back to this little bit later what he is saying is proktam atma buddhi prasada jam we will come back to that in a, uh, a few minutes so what he is saying is like for example we need to relate to this right so if somebody wants to lose weight they are now used to a certain lifestyle I don't want to do anything different. If they put me on the treadmill and I am like puffing and panting, I don't like it. But somehow my ego was on the line. I told I am going to go to the gym and lose 10 pounds. Okay? Now everybody is watching not to cheer you but to make you as a joke. So that ego is now on the line so i you are like pressing on agre vishamiva it is like poison who who which idiot made me sign this i am cussing in my mind but in the end you pers- persevere for you are like not even a good candidate you are like slow and what normally would have taken 2 months now you are like 8 months into the program but now you have beautifully toned yourself you are becoming a good example of how to lose weight even if it is long term parinamo amrutopam so in your life also you will have some things that you will have to work hard for maybe when you started learning about how to save money may some of you may be able to relate you could not rub two nickels you could not even save little money but over a period of time through learning falling a uh, uh, flat having your nose punched you figured out small small things 
and over the years and maybe even decades now you got a decent amount of portfolio so all that was it worth it was worth so anything if the goal is higher and if you are going to work towards it and if it is taking you there it is worth so we will see some tips towards the end uh, i will share an article from swami sivananda he gives some 12 simple tips practical tips that you can go and put it in your back corner so it is not going to be as technical or complex as our discussion is going to be it's going to be like very simple straightforward more like as that sense of relief right from the thought experiment after having the torture of standing with that bag of 1 kilo of something right it's going to be like that when compared to this entire lecture that article is going to be like a breeze now you got the second idea this is the one which we are all familiar so pay attention to this because you will be able to relate to every single word of this vishe indriya samyogat yatat agre amrutopamam pariname vishamiva tatsukam rajasam srudam what he is saying is let's break it down vishaya the senses objects of senses indriya senses so the sense objects and senses samyogat from their interaction yatat agre so what happens look at how happiness comes to our mind all our happiness is a product of our senses and sense objects i like to eat something nice my eyes uh, go and uh, tell me where it is my uh, uh, hands and legs go to that place but my tongue is the one that tells me ha ah, this is very nice tasty then there is some beautiful smell coming of it so i my senses are again informing me what a pleasure there is a nice beautiful sense of touch or nice music whatever it is it is a product of our senses and sense objects that gives us that kind of pleasure and what is he saying krishna yatat agre amrutopamam it starts like beautiful nectar pariname vishamiva it is like pure poison we have to look at some extreme examples to understand this because normally our mind doesn't open up we won't accept let's say that there is a guy who likes to eat and he eats all sorts of things sweet this that whatever now he is eating this sweet he is uh, spending his 20s and 30s and whatever eating all sorts of sweets he loves it you can tell that now here is a gentleman our lady who loves their sweet in their 40s they go to the doctor and the doctor says you know what we did a urine test looks like some of what you are eating is showing up there you may be a sweet person but that sweetness is also being exuded in the urine and after a few more tests they say um we really figured out that you are a sweet person because all your blood is filled with all sorts of interesting sugar so we call that as diabetes it's not a interesting thing to have so you better watch out and then the person says okay okay i am being a good they put him on insulin this that whatever few more years go by goes to the doctor now the doctor says hey buddy you know we told you no sugar right 
just do one more thing. We are also seeing signs of your blood pressure going up, so no salt also. What happened? Agre Amurto Pamam. Ah, nice Rasgulla. Nice Laddu. Pariname Vishamiva. Tatsukam Rajasam Sridham. So, that which starts beautiful but gets ugly right from the get go, shortly thereafter, is called Rajasik happiness. Now, if you really look, we have only few things which you and I would call as in the Sattvic category. Now, we are going to come back to that in a minute because that's what we want. We want lasting happiness. We want qualitatively better happiness. We want that happiness not to go ebb and flow. We want a continuous stream of that happiness. That's what we are after, right? That's why we have the title I plus I want. What? Happiness. So now, Yadagre cha anubande cha sukam mohanatmanaha nidra alasya pramodottamam tat tamasam udaratam. What he says is, Yadagre cha anubande. In the beginning and end also, it completely deludes your mind as happiness. But that happiness is being perceived because it induces sleep, laziness, heedlessness, whatever, right? That's called thamasic. And normally we need an example to understand this, right? Now, this is where a lot of us will have to be honest to look up and look at the real person in the mirror to be honest. It takes guts to accept. Here is where we start. If we are having something in this category, it is very difficult to confront ourselves because we will come immediately with 150 justifications. You don't know. Sachidananda, you don't know. What is a good example of this? Now, if I tell drug addiction, you will say like nobody is doing drug addiction. That's only few people. Why are you even bringing that? But if I told you alcohol, the ones who have touched it, they will say, no, 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 you don't understand. You know, wine is so good for health. Even this doctor is telling you that, that doctor is telling you that. This uh, medical journal says this, but you don't understand. It's part of the culture. What kind of ridiculous person are you? You don't, you want to rob all the pleasures of our life? Here is where Krishna shows the mirror to the person who has his eyes open. What is the point if I show you a mirror and your eyes are uh, uh, shut and your uh, eyes are also blindfolded and on top of that you uh, cover yourself in an entire uh, sack head to toe? It's not going to help. So what happens? This thing in the beginning, look at it like people who are alcoholic right or people who get high on anything for that matter whether it is alcohol or whether it is uh, 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 womanizing or whether it is a, a, a drug or whatever what happens that happiness you think is an illusion though it is detrimental to you every uh, a peg of alcohol or every uh, beer or everything what the person is consuming, you go and look at the biochemistry, what happens in that person's body, how the body is struggling to get rid of it. You and I think that, oh, no, 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 the body is trying to integrate. That is no value. 
there is no productive value your body needs alcohol for or whether it is a drug or whatever may be the case right so those kind of things right in the beginning also they delude you a person let's say that he is totally drunk what happens he doesn't even know if he is wearing clothes if he is naked if he is what he is doing we don't know then he is busy puking the head out of him and then he has got a terrible hangover the next day and on top of that he has all sorts of things going on and yet he is bragging he or she is bragging ha <laughs> ha i finished one bottle of whatever so that kind of happiness where we don't really have happiness but we fool ourselves as happiness is called tamasic let's quickly go over a couple of things so that we don't want to overshoot our time we need to go back to that question we left we parked it there right about satvikam so it says proktam that is it is said atma buddhi prasadajam atma we know our self buddhi we know intelligence prasadajam that means it is born out of born out of the happiness born out of the contentment the intelligence that arises in atma aha now he is telling something else now we will come back to our yardstick which we have touched many many times in the past it's the ability of a human being to operate at different levels of vision or different capabilities we all know this level it's called the purusharthas dharma artha kama moksha but what actually happened in dharma we will come to that in a minute let's start with something what we know we know kama desire i get desire i want it now i want it i want to have some resources handy because it will help me in getting those desires to that level only our understanding of artha is we don't understand most of us don't understand all the big things let's say that you are working in some big it company or something like that you won't even know all the different aspects of the software even that you are supporting or writing but you are making a living out of it and then you are going to take that money and you are going to enjoy whatever legitimate pleasures that it can buy so you and i are comfortable with this artha kama exchange that's all we know but if you go back sometime back we talked about sita in ramayana there is a discussion happening between sita and rama they enter the forest in aranyakanda as soon as they enter they meet a couple of rishis sutikshna and sharavanga and when they are coming out of sutikshna's uh, ashrama sita as rama rama why do you have to go to the forest now for deeper we can just hang out with these rishis right it would be fine but you want to go deeper into dandakaranya then you will meet all these uh, asuras rakshasas and needlessly you will have to pick a quarrel with them and kill them why do you want to go deeper so she is trying to understand where rama is coming from if rama is going there out of spite or bigotry or is he going there because of driven by his dharma now we have 
bringing this idea of dharma again and she makes some of the most succinct and crisp insights she gives some deep insights she says dharmat artha prabhavati dharmat prabhavate sukham dharmena labhyate sarvam dharma saram idam jagat let's break it down dharmat artha prabhavati from dharma arises originates artha resources by following dharma by following righteousness by upholding dharma you get all the resources you need dharmat prabhavate sukham only from dharma you get lasting sukham imagine this a person is there um let's say that uh, he wants money to enjoy whatever now instead he goes to a bank and he robs them now the police is after him even if he is hiding how long can he be hiding one day he has to come out he is getting you know there was a guy uh, like few years ago uh, this guy committed a crime in uh, like 30 years ago or something like that in uh, massachusetts that is on the eastern coast of us then he goes to california like he did it like 30 35 years ago after 30 35 years ago he gets caught the long arm of the law finally catches up with him when he was not expecting to say the least so dharmat prabhavate sukham but if you had earned your hard earned money and it's your own money nobody is going of course the thieves can come robbers can come that's a different thing but basically it's for you to enjoy unless that is a prarabdha that is a different story dharmena labhyate sarvam only by upholding dharma you get all things dharmena labhyate sarvam dharma saram idam jagat the real essence of this universe is nothing but dharma probity the real essence of this universe is dharma according to sita so let's go back and apply this what we just looked at and see what happens when you uphold dharma when you uphold dharma sita just presented two clear insights you will not only get the resources you will also be able to achieve things that will give you joy and that sukham will be lasting so on one track you are all set because that's all you understood but she says this is the side effect what is the main effect by following dharma main effect of following dharma is you will get liberation moksha you will you are not even thinking of it but that is what now bring this idea and apply into what krishna is talking about in that shloka etad agre vishamiva parinamo parinamme amruta upamam just like amrutam what is amrutam mrutam means that which dies or death amrutam means deathlessness what gives you deathlessness when you realize that you are an atman and what you are doing here tatsukam satvikam and then krishna for unlike the second one he qualifies 
how did that uh, sukham arise he says the situation senses and sense objects combine to form that sukham in rajoguna but here he says proktam atma buddhi prasadajam he says that you are going to get that happiness that is coming that is that satisfaction the fruits that are born out of that intelligence but where did that arise from that arise that arose from the atma what is the title we are talking about i plus i want we want long lasting happiness we want we established that you will get that happiness only by following dharma by following dharma you are going to get long lasting happiness at the same time as you follow dharma your mind gets increasingly more satvik and this sattva this dharma will eventually lead you to liberation so you are going to get that self realization atma buddhi prasadajam so the happiness is not a product of interaction of sense and sense objects like we are all used to but here it is not only a elevated goal like hey i want to lose weight i want to make money that is all okay goals because look here what you are doing what is the hint here when you are having a elevated goal you are taking your mind away from the kama level and you are thinking at artha level is that not true you are looking at resources rather than i me myself now instead of looking at resources you take it even further higher you are putting it on dharma now that dharma is going to give you not only the lasting results of happiness and all those things but at the other side it is going to lead you to liberation so that's how we interpret that particular shloka with the help of this clue we get we picked it up from ramayana and then what i am going to do now is uh, we are almost done with our talk i am going to drop this article uh for everyone's benefit and uh, you can read it at your leisure but i am going to quickly cover them so that for folks who are not going to read it at least something is there as a take home at least as a uh, motivation um you will have this um let's see i think that's the one yeah that's the one yeah okay so um let's look at the 12 keys to happiness what uh, swami sivananda uh, now it looks like we are going to be a janitor collecting all these keys but it's okay the very first thing what he gives is a clear clue for what we just spoke so when we are going to set a, a develop a clear cut aim he says now here we said if your aim is only going to be resources or artha it's high but it's not high enough dharma is the highest goal so that should be the goal we are gunning for then he says you established a goal now how do you go there you need a program you need a program to go step by step to achieve that so i it's one thing to say that hey i want i want something i want to uh, lose 20 pounds or i want to be a millionaire i want to do this that instead of just wishing in thin air can you focus on having a step by step plan and that would take you the third tip he gives you is guard your health now i am going to expand take the liberty of expanding that what he says health you want to expand not only your physical health your mental health 
emotional health, your financial health, your relationship health, your and all the way up to spiritual health, right? So you want to exp expand that. So that point what he gave is just to make us ponder, but he is just giving you bullets just to remember that. Then he tells, conserve your energy. Don't waste it on frivolous things. Tomorrow, if you have an important exam and uh, if all your friends, they don't have any exam or they don't care about the exam, they come and tell, hey, let's play a game of cricket and it's hot outside. Morning to evening, all you are doing is playing cricket. Now, even if you come home uh, well in time to revise your subject, you are thoroughly beat. You are not in any. So, basically, conserve your energy to that will also give you happiness. We are looking at the 12 keys to happiness by Swami Sivananda. The other thing he says is, talks about, now you have to understand the clues he gives ties right back into what we were discussing so far. He talks about value character. That means like give um, a preference to character. Why? The character again is going to keep you rooted in dharma. You, it is going to teach you all the... Ba you may be thinking, hey, what has character got to do with happiness? Imagine if you are a polite person, if you are an honest person, if you are going to be a person uh, devoid of your egoism or uh, uh, the selfishness and uh, pride and that sort of thing, you are going to have a better chance at happiness than a person who is covered with all that. Then he also says, you, you may not have certain things, you may not have certain qualities, but when you look at something, let's say for you come to a satsanga like this, or when you go and study a book, or when you go and look at certain traits, you want to adopt them in your life, especially the ones with are elevated values. Then the other thing is he t says pray to God. Now when he says pray to God, it is not like go and give your laundry list of wishes and wants. It's not to take your litany of woes and dumping on him and say like, hey, Savior, please take care of this. What he is saying is, you look at Bhagawan and do only two, a few things you can ask Bhagawan without any hesitation at all time. One is you ask Bhagawan, please let me realize my real nature, I, that I am an Atman. The second thing you want to ask Bhagawan is that let me know more about you. But those are the two things we never ask Bhagawan. We ask everything else. I want this, I want that, I want to get married, I want a girl, I want a boy. After marriage, you want a, hey, I want a child, I don't have children for the last several years, I want a child, oh, okay, now you got a child, now you say, oh, please make this child behave, this child is always misbehaving. And then you finally, full life, you have a list after list after list of wants. But the, what are the two things we should ask or can ask? to know about your real nature and to know more about Bhagawan. So that's something which we want. Then you look at the hagiographies of people, great Mahatmas, not people who have been certified and called as Mahatma by a British court. That's not the Mahatma we are talking about. We are talking about the real meaning of people who were fit to be called as Mahatmas. You look at their life, how they, uh, if you don't know or recall, go to any Itihasa Puranas, you will be finding so many of them. In fact, you will not have enough time to read all of them in your lifetime. I will guarantee you that much. So you look at them and you try to look at their personalities and try to learn from that. Then the other thing he says is be kind. Why is kindness an important thing for happiness? 
because what you are going to sow is what you are going to get. So you be the person, the epicenter of happiness and solace and comfort to others. So, and also you will find that you are interconnected with every being. So when you see somebody else injured, if you are an elevated person operating at uh, from a dharmic plane, you are also going to feel that connection. So obviously you are going to be kind. The other thing is always uphold satya. Now you can say satya, I mean I don't tell lies. That is the smallest percentage of the definition of the word satya. Speaking truth at all costs, we don't do. This is like being rooted in truth. That means I have to also operate in the level of who I am. When I am thinking I am the body, I am not, I am not being truthful because that's not my real nature. So, like that we can expand the word definition of satya to encompass a lot more than what we normally understand. The other idea is uh, serving others. Now, that is just another extension of the previous points. Because if you realize you are a reflection of Narayana, that is the same Narayana that is enlivening every single person here. So, or every single living being. So, I am going to feel the same divine presence everywhere. The last thing is to think nobly and uh, have some elevated thoughts. Now, you can go and look at uh, his thoughts. They are more uh, deeper and uh, simpler and uh, you can absorb them and they are like practical tips which you can implement in your life. Here for people who are like, hey, I want bullet points. I listen to you for an over an hour. What are the bullet points? So these are the bullet points you can take home and look at yourself like, can I improve on this? So I know we have been a bit uh, over the time which I intended. So I'm going to pause here and uh, let's uh, quickly turn our attention to Bhagavan. Jai Sri Ram. Jai Shri Krishna, Har Har Mahadev.